Act One of The Bourgeois Gentleman by Moliere. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Bourgeois Gentleman by Moliere. Translated by Philip Dwight Jones. The Cast. Monsieur Jourdain, Bourgeois. Read by Todd. Madame Jourdain, read by Leanne. Lucille, read by Lydia. Nicole, read by Charlotte Duckett. Cleante, read by Thomas Peter. Coviel, read by Peter Tucker. Dorant, read by Thomas Ibarra. The Role of Dorimene, read by Sarah Holtz. Music Master, read by Leanne Yao. The Pupil of the Music Master, read by Zames Curran. Dancing Master, read by Beth Thomas. Fencing Master, read by Jennifer Fournier. Philosophy Master, read by John Burlinson. Taylor, read by Adrian Stroitz. Taylor's Apprentice, read by Ariel Lipshaw. First Lackey, read by David Olson. Second Lackey, read by Marianne. First Man, read by Mika. Second Man, read by Thomas Peter. Woman, by Nikki Myers. First Male Singer, recorded by Mika. Second Male Singer, read by Chuck Williamson. Woman Singer, recorded by Nikki Myers. Musician. Read by Chuck Williamson. Narrated by Abai. The scene is Monsieur Jourdain's house in Paris. Act One. Scene One. Music master, dancing master, musicians, and dancers. The play opens with a great assembly of instruments, and in the middle of the stage is a pupil of the music master seated at a table composing a melody which Monsieur Jourdain has ordered for a serenade. Music Master to Musicians Come, come into this room. Sit there and wait until he comes. Dancing Master to Dancers And you too, on this side? Music Master to Pupil is it done? Yes. Let's see. This is good. Is it something new? Yes, it's a melody for a serenade that I sent him to composing here, while waiting for our man to awake. May I see it? You'll hear it, with a dialogue, when he comes. He won't be long. Our work, yours and mine, is not trivial at present. This is true. We found here such a man as we both need. This is a nice source of income for us. This... Monsieur Joudon, with the visions of nobility and gallantry that he has got into his head. You and I should hope that everyone resembled him. Not entirely. I could wish that he understood better the things that we give him. It's true that he understands them poorly, but he pays well, and that's what our art needs, now more than anything else. As for me, I admit, I feed a little on glory. Applause touches me, and I hold that, in all the fine arts, it is painful to produce for dolts, to endure the barbarous opinions of a fool about my choreography. It is a pleasure, don't tell me otherwise, to work for people who can appreciate the fine points of an art, who know how to give a sweet reception to the beauties of a work, and, by pleasurable approbations, gratify us for our labour. Yes, the most agreeable recompense we can receive for the things we do is to see them recognized and flattered by an applause that honors us. There is nothing, in my opinion, that pays us better for all our fatigue, and it is an exquisite delight to receive the praises of the well-informed. I agree, and I enjoy them as you do. There is surely nothing more agreeable than the applause you speak of, but that incense does not provide a living. Pure praises do not provide a comfortable existence. It is necessary to add something solid, and the best way to praise it is to praise with cash in hand. He is a man, it's true, whose insight is very slight, who talks nonsense about everything and applauds only for the wrong reasons, 
But his money makes up for his judgments. He has discernment in his purse. His praises are in cash. And this ignorant bourgeois is worth more to us, as you see, than the educated nobleman who introduced us here. There is some truth in what you say, but I find that you lean a little too heavily on money, and material interest is something so base that a man of good taste should never show an attachment to it. You are ready enough to receive the money your man gives you. Assuredly, but I don't place all my happiness in it, and I could wish that together with his fortune he had some good taste in things. I could wish it too. That's what both of us are working for as much as we can. But, in any case, he gives us the means to make ourselves known in this world, and he will pay others if they will praise him. Here he comes. Scene 2 Monsieur Jourdain, two lackeys, music master, dancing master, pupil, musicians, and dancers. Well, gentlemen, what's this? Are you going to show me your little skit? How? What little skit? Well, the... what do you call it? Your prologue or dialogue of songs and dances. Uh-huh. You find us ready for you. I kept you waiting a little, but it's because I'm having myself dressed today like the people of quality, and my tailor sent me some silk stockings that I thought I would never get on. We are here only to wait upon your leisure. I want you both to stay until they have brought me my suit, so that you may see me. Whatever you would like. You will see me fitted out properly, from head to foot. We have no doubt of it. I had this robe made for me. It's very attractive. My tailor told me the people of quality dress like this in the mornings. It's marvelously becoming. Hey, lackeys, my two lackeys. What do you wish, sir? Nothing. I just wanted to see if you were paying attention. To the two masters. What say you of my liveries? They're magnificent. Monsieur Jourdain, half opening his gown, showing a pair of tight red velvet breeches and a green velvet vest that he is wearing. Here again is a sort of lounging dress to perform my morning exercises in. It is elegant. Lackey? Sir? Uh, the other lackey. Sir? Hold my robe. To the masters. Do you think I look good? Very well. No one could look better. Now, let's have a look at your little show. I would like very much for you to listen to a melody. He, indicating his student, has just composed for the serenade that you ordered from me. He's one of my pupils who has an admirable talent for these kinds of things. Yes, but you should not have had that done by a pupil. You yourself were none too good for that piece of work. <laughs> you must not let the name of pupil fool you, sir. Pupils of this sort know as much as the greatest masters, and the melody is as fine as could be made. Just listen. Monsieur Jourdain to lackeys. Give me my robe so I can listen better. Wait, I believe I would be better without a robe. No, give it back, that would be better. Musician, singing. I languish night and day. My suffering is extreme, since to your control your lovely eyes subjected me. If you thus treat fair Iris, those you love, alas, how would you treat an enemy? This song seems to me a little mournful. It lulls to sleep, and I would like it if you could liven it up a little here and there. It is necessary, sir. Let the tune be suited to the words. Someone taught me a perfectly pretty one some time ago. Listen. Now, how does it go? By my faith, I don't know. There are sheep in it. Sheep? Yes. Ah. Uh, he sings. I thought my Jonathan as beautiful as sweet. I thought my Jonathan far sweeter than a sheep. Alas, alas. She is a hundred times, a thousand times, more cruel than tigers in the woods. Isn't it pretty? The prettiest in the world. And you sing it well. It's without having learned music. You ought to learn it, sir, as you are learning dancing. They are two arts which have a close connection. 
and which open the mind of a man to fine things. And do people of quality learn music, too? Yes, sir. I'll learn it, then. But I don't know when I can find time, for besides the fencing master who's teaching me, I have also engaged a master of philosophy who is to begin this morning. Philosophy is something, but music, sir, music. Music and dancing. Music and dancing. That's all that's necessary. There's nothing so useful in a state as music. There is nothing so necessary to men as dancing. Without music, a state cannot subsist. Without the dance, a man can do nothing. All the disorders, all the wars one sees in this world happen only from not learning music. All the misfortunes of mankind, all the dreadful disasters that fill the history books, the blunders of politicians and the faults of omission of great commanders, all this comes from not knowing how to dance. How is that? Does not war result from a lack of agreement between men? That is true. And if all men learned music, wouldn't that be a means of bringing about harmony and of seeing universal peace in the world? You are right. When a man has committed a mistake in his conduct, in family affairs, or in affairs of government of a state, or in the command of an army, do we not always say, he took a bad step in such and such an affair? Yes, that's said. And can taking a bad step result from anything but not knowing how to dance? It's true. You are both right. It makes you see the excellence and usefulness of music and the dance. I understand that now. Do you wish to see your pieces? Yes. I have already told you that this is a little attempt I have made to show the different passions that music can express. Very good. Music master to musicians. Here, come forward. To Monsieur Jourdain. You must imagine that they are dressed as shepherds. Why always as shepherds? You see nothing but that everywhere. When we have characters that are to speak in music, it's necessary, for believability, to make them pastoral. Singing has always been assigned to shepherds, and it is scarcely natural dialogue for princes or merchants to sing their passions. All right, all right. Let's see. Dialogue in music. A woman and two men. A heart, under the domination of love, is always with a thousand cares oppressed. It is said that we gladly languish, gladly sigh, but despite what can be said, there is nothing so sweet as our liberty. There is nothing so sweet as the loving fires that make two hearts beat as one. One cannot live without amorous desires. Take love from life, you take away the pleasures. It would be sweet to submit to love's rule, if one could find faithful love. But alas, O oh cruel rule, no faithful shepherdess is to be seen, and that inconstant sex, much too unworthy, must renounce love eternally. Pleasing or door. Happy liberty. Deceitful woman. How precious you are to me. How you please my heart. How horrible you are to me. Ah, leave for love that mortal hate. We can, we can show you a faithful shepherdess. Alas, where to find her? In order to defend our reputation, I want to offer you my heart. But, shepherdess, can I believe that it will not be deceitful? We'll see, through experience, who of the two loves best. Who lacks constancy may the gods destroy. With, With ardor so beautiful, beautiful let us be inflamed. inflamed. Ah, how, how sweet, sweet it is to love when two hearts are faithful. Is that all? Yes. I find it well done. And there are some pretty enough sayings in it. Here for my presentation is a little display of the loveliest movements and the most beautiful attitudes with which a dance can possibly be varied. Are there shepherds too? 
They're whatever you please. Let's go. Four dancers execute all the different movements and all the kinds of steps that the dancing master commands, and this dance makes the first interlude. End of Act One Act Two of The Bourgeois Gentleman by Moliere. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Two. Scene One. Monsieur Jourdain, Music Master, Dancing Master, Lackeys. That's not all that bad. And those people there hop around well. When the dance is combined with the music, it will have even better effect, and you will see something quite good in the little ballet we have prepared for you. That's for later, when the person I ordered all this for is to do me the honor of coming here to dine. Everything is ready. However, sir, this is not enough. A person like you, who lives magnificently, and who are inclined towards fine things, should have a concert of music here, every Wednesday or every Thursday. Is that what people of quality do? Yes, sir. Then I'll have them. Will it be fine? Without doubt. You must have three voices, a tenor, a soprano, and a bass, who will be accompanied by a bass viol, a viol bow and a clavecin for the chords, with two violins to play the ritornelles. You must also add a trumpet marine. The trumpet marine is an instrument that pleases me, and it's harmonious. Leave it to us to manage things. At least, don't forget to send the musicians to sing at table. You will have everything you should have. But above all, let the ballet be fine. You will be pleased with it, and, among other things, with certain minuets you will find in it. Ah, minuets are my dance, and I would like you to see me dance them. Come, my dancing master. A hat, sir, if you please. La, 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 in cadence, please. La, 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 your right leg. La, 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 don't move your shoulders so. La, 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 your arms are wrong. La, 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 raise your head, turn the toe out. La, la, la. Straighten your body up. Oh, how was that? The best. By the way, teach me how to bow to salute a marchioness. I shall need to know soon. How you must bow to salute a marchioness? Yes, a marchioness named Doramini. Give me your hand. No, you only have to do it. I'll remember it well. If you want to salute her with a great deal of respect, you must first bow and step back, then bow three times as you walk towards her, and at the last one bow down to her knees. Monsieur Jourdain, after the dancing master has illustrated. Do it some. Good. Sir, your fencing master is here. Tell him to come in here for my lesson. I want you to see me perform. Scene two. Fencing master, music master, dancing master, Monsieur Jourdain, a lackey. Fencing master. After giving a foil to Monsieur Jourdain. Come, sir, the salute. Your body straight, a little inclined upon the left thigh, your legs not so wide apart, your feet both in a line, your wrist opposite your hip, the point of your sword even with your shoulder, the arm not so much extended, the left hand at the level of the eye, the left shoulder more squared, the head up, the expression bold, advance, the body steady, beat cart and thrust, one, two, recover, again, with the foot firm, leap back. When you make a pass, sir, you must first disengage, and your body must be well turned, one, two, Come, beat terse and thrust. Advance. Stop there. One, two, recover. Repeat. Leap back. On guard, sir, on guard. The fencing master touches him two or three times with the foil while saying, on guard. Oh, how was that? You did marvelously. As I have told you, 
the entire secret of fencing lies in two things, to give and not to receive. And as I demonstrated to you the other day, it is impossible for you to receive if you know how to turn your opponent's sword from the line of your body. This depends solely on a slight movement of the wrist, either inward or outward. In this way, then, a man, without courage, is sure to kill his man and not be killed himself? Without doubt. Didn't you see the demonstration? Yes. And thus, you have seen how men like me should be considered by the state, and how the science of fencing is more important than all the other useless sciences, such as dancing, music. Careful there, Monsieur Swordsman. Speak of the dance only with respect. I beg you to speak better of the excellence of music. You are amusing fellows to want to compare your sciences with mine. See the self-importance of the man. My little dancing master, I'll make you dance as you ought. And you, my little musician, I'll make you sing in a pretty way. Monsieur Clanger of Iron, I'll teach you your trade. Monsieur Jourdain, to the dancing master. Are you crazy to quarrel with him, who knows tiers and quatre, and who can kill a man by demonstration? I disdain his demonstrations, and his tiers, and his quarte. Careful, I tell you. What? You little impertinent. Oh, my fencing master. What? You big workhorse. Oh, my dancing master. If I throw myself on you. Careful. If I get my hands on you. Be nice. I'll go over you with a curry comb in such a way. Mercy. I'll give you a beating such as. I beg of you. Let us teach him a little how to talk. Oh, Lord, stop. Scene 3. Philosophy Master, Music Master, Dancing Master, Fencing Master, Monsieur Jourdain, Lackeys. Aha! Monsieur Philosopher! You come just in time with your philosophy. Come, make a little peace among these people. What's happening? What's the matter, gentlemen? They have got into a rage over the superiority of their professions, to the point of injurious words and of wanting to come to blows. What? Gentlemen, must you act this way? Haven't you read the learned treatise that Seneca composed on anger? Is there anything more base and more shameful than this passion, which turns a man into a savage beast? And shouldn't reason be the mistress of all our activities? Well, Sir, he has just abused both of us by despising the dance which I practice, and music which is his profession. A wise man is above all the insults that can be spoken to him, and the grand reply one should make to such outrages is moderation and patience. They both had the audacity of trying to compare their professions with mine. Should that disturb you? Men should not dispute amongst themselves about vainglory and rank. That which perfectly distinguishes one from the other is wisdom and virtue. I insist to him that dance is a science to which one cannot do enough honour. And I, that music is something that all the ages have revered. And I insist to them that the science of fencing is the finest and the most necessary of all sciences. And where, then, will philosophy be? I find you all very impertinent to speak with this arrogance in front of me, and impudently to give the name of science to things that one should not even honour with the name of art and that cannot be classified except under the name of miserable gladiator, singer, and buffoon. Get out, you dog of a philosopher. Get out, you worthless pedant. 
Get out, you ill-mannered cur. What rascals that you are! The philosopher flings himself at them, and all three go out fighting. Monsieur philosopher! Rogues! Scoundrels! Insolent dogs! Monsieur philosopher! A pox on the beast! Gentlemen! Impudent rogues! Monsieur philosopher! The devil take the jackass! Gentlemen! Villains! Monsieur philosopher! To the devil with the impertinent fellow! Gentlemen! Rascals! Beggars! Traitors! Impostors! They leave. Monsieur philosopher! Gentlemen! Monsieur philosopher! Gentlemen! Monsieur philosopher! Oh! Fight as much as you like! I don't know what to do, and I'll not spoil my robe to separate you. I would be a fool to go among them and receive some damaging blow. Scene 4. Philosophy Master, Monsieur Jourdain. Philosophy Master, straightening the collar that indicates he is a philosopher. Now, to our lesson. Oh, sir, I am distressed by the blows they gave you. It's nothing. A philosopher knows how to take these things, and I'll compose a satire against them in the style of juvenile which will fix them nicely. Let it be. What would you like to learn? Everything I can, for I have every desire in the world to be educated, and I'm furious that my father and mother did not make me study all the sciences when I was young. This is a reasonable sentiment. Nam sine doctrina vita est quasi mortis imago. You understand that, and you doubtless know Latin. Yes, but act as if I did not know it. Tell me what it says. It says that without science, life is almost an image of death. That Latin is right. Don't you know some principles, some basics of the sciences? Oh, yes, I can read and write. Where would it please you for us to begin? Would you like me to teach you logic? What is this logic? It is that which teaches the three operations of the mind. What are these three operations of the mind? The first, the second, and the third. The first is to conceive well by means of the universals. The second is to judge well by means of the categories. And the third is to draw well a conclusion by means of figures. Barbara, Celerant, Darii, Ferraio, Berylipton, etc. Those words are too ugly. This logic doesn't suit me at all. Let's learn something else that's prettier. Would you like to learn morality? Morality? Yes. What does it say, this morality? It treats of happiness, teaches men to moderate their passions, and... No, let's leave that. I'm as caloric as all the devils, and there's no morality that sticks. I want to be as full of anger as I want whenever I like. Would you like to learn physics? What's it about, this physics? Physics explains the principles of natural things and the properties of the material world. It discourses on the nature of the elements, of metals, minerals, of stones, of plants and animals, and teaches the causes of all the meteors, the rainbow, the will of the wisps, the comets, lightning, thunder, thunderbolts, rain, snow, hail, wind, and whirlwinds. There's too much commotion in it, too much confusion. Then what do you want me to teach you? Teach me how to spell. Very gladly. Afterwards, you may teach me the almanac, to know when there is a moon and when not. So be it. 
following your thought and treating this matter as a philosopher it is necessary to begin according to the order of things by an exact knowledge of the nature of letters and the different ways of pronouncing them all and thereupon i must tell you letters are divided into vowels called vowels because they express the voice and into consonants because they sound with the vowels and only mark the diverse articulations of the voice there are five vowels or voices a e i o u i understand all that the vowel a is formed by opening the mouth widely a its vowels are to be given the sounds in vocalizing a i e o u ah ah yes and the vowel e is formed by approaching the lower jaw to the upper a e Ah, eh, ah, eh. By my faith, yes. Ah, oh, how fine. And the vowel I, by bringing the jaws still nearer each other and stretching the two corners of the mouth towards the ears. A, mm. e. I, 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 I. That's true. Long live science. The vowel O is formed by opening the jaws and drawing together the two corners of the lips, upper and lower. O. O. Oh, there's nothing truer. Ah, ee, ah, oh, ah, oh. That's admirable. Ah, oh, ah, oh. The opening of the mouth happens to make a little circle. Hmm? which represents an O. Oh, 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 you are right. Oh, ah, what a fine thing it is to know something. The vowel U is formed by bringing the teeth nearly together without completely joining them and thrusting the two lips outward also bringing them nearly together without completely joining them you ooh ooh there's nothing truer your two lips thrust out as if you were making a face, whence it results that if you want to make a face at someone and mock him, you have only to say to him, You! <laughs> ooh, ooh! That's true! Ah! Why didn't I study sooner in order to know all that? Tomorrow we shall look at all the other letters, which are the consonants. Are there things as curious about them as about these? Without a doubt. The consonant D, for example, 
is pronounced by clapping the tongue above the upper teeth. D. 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 Yes. Ah, what fine things. Fine things. The F by pressing the upper teeth against the lower lip. F. 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 That's the truth. Ah, my father and my mother, how I wish you ill. And the R by carrying the tip of the tongue to the top of the palate, so that being grazed by the air that comes out with force, it yields to it and comes back always to the same place, making a kind of trill. Arr, arr. That's true. Ah, oh, what a clever man you are. And how I have lost time. I'll explain to you all these strange things to their very depths. Please do. But now I must confide in you. I'm in love with a lady of great quality, and I wish that you would help me write something to her in a little note that I will let fall at her feet. Very well. That will be gallant, yes? Without doubt. Is it verse that you wish to write her? No, no, no verse. Do you want only prose? No, I don't want either prose or verse. It must be one or the other. Why? Because, sir, there is no other way to express oneself than with prose or verse. Is there nothing but prose or verse? No, sir. Everything that is not prose is verse. And everything that is not verse is prose. And when one speaks, what is that then? Prose. What? When I say, Nicole, bring me my slippers, and give me my nightcap, that's prose? Yes, sir. By my faith. For more than forty years I have been speaking prose without knowing anything about it. And I am much obliged to you for having taught me that. I would like, then, to put into a note to her, Beautiful Marchioness, your lovely eyes make me die of love. But I want that put in a gallant manner, and very nicely turned. Put it that the fires of her eyes reduce your heart to cinders, that you suffer night and day for her the torments of a— No, 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 I want none of that. I only want you to say, Beautiful Marchioness, your lovely eyes make me die of love. The thing requires a little lengthening. No, I tell you, I want only those words in the note, but turned stylishly, well arranged, as is necessary. Please tell me just to see the diverse ways they could be put. One could put them first of all as you said them. Beautiful Marchioness, your lovely eyes make me die of love or else of love to die make me beautiful marchioness your beautiful eyes or else your lovely eyes of love make me beautiful marchioness die or else Die, your lovely eyes, beautiful marchioness, of love make me, or else me make your lovely eyes die, beautiful marchioness of love. But of all those ways, which is the best? 
the way you said it. Beautiful Marchioness, your lovely eyes make me die of love. I never studied, and yet I made the whole thing up at the first try? I thank you with all my heart, and I ask you to come tomorrow early. I shall not fail to do so. Please. What, hasn't my suit come yet? No, sir. That cursed tailor makes me wait all day when I have so much to do. I'm enraged. May the quartan fever shake that tormentor of a tailor. To the devil with a tailor. May the plague choke the tailor. If I had him here now, that detestable tailor, that dog of a tailor, that traitor of a tailor, I... Scene 5. Master Tailor, Apprentice Tailor Carrying Suit, Monsieur Jourdain, Lackeys. Ah! You're here! I was getting into a rage against you. I could not come sooner, and I put twenty men to work on your suit. You sent me some silk hose, so small, that I had all the difficulty in the world putting them on, and already there are two broken stitches. They get bigger. Too much so. Yes, if I always break the stitches. You also had made for me a pair of shoes that pinch furiously. Not at all, sir. How not at all? No, they don't pinch you at all. I tell you, they pinch me. You imagine that? I imagine it because I feel it. That's a good reason for you. Wait, here is the finest court suit, and the best matched. It's a masterpiece to have invented a serious suit that is not black, and I give six attempts to the best tailors to equal it. What's this? You put the flowers upside down. You didn't tell me you wanted them right side up. Did I have to tell you that? Yes, surely. All the people of quality wear them this way. The people of quality wear the flowers upside down? Yes, sir. Oh, it's all right then. If you like, I'll put them the right side up. No, no. You have only to say so. No, I tell you. You've made it very well. Do you think the suit is going to look good on me? What a question! I defy a painter with his brush to do anything that would fit you better. I have a worker in my place who is the greatest genius in the world at mounting a Rhinegrave, and another who is the hero of the age at assembling a doublet. The peruke and the plumes? Are they correct? Everything's good. Monsieur Jourdain, looking at the tailor's suit. Ah, ah! Monsieur Taylor, here's the material from the last suit you made for me. I know it well. You see, the material seemed so fine that I wanted a suit made of it for myself. Yes, but you should not have cut it out of mine. Do you want to put on your suit? Yes, give it to me. Wait, that is not the way it's done. I have brought men to dress you in a cadence. These kind of suits are put on with ceremony. Hey, there! Come in, you. Put this suit on the gentleman the way you do with people of quality. Four apprentice tailors enter. Two of them pull off Monsieur Jourdain's breeches made for his morning exercises, and two others pull off his waistcoat. Then they put on his new suit. Monsieur Jourdain promenades among them and shows them his suit for their approval. All this to the cadence of instrumental music. My dear gentlemen, please to give the apprentices a small tip. What did you call me? My dear gentlemen. My dear gentlemen. That's what it is to dress like people of quality. Go all your life dressed like a bourgeois, and they never call you, my dear gentleman. Here, take this for the, my dear gentleman. My lord, we are very much obliged to you. My lord, oh, oh, my lord. Wait, my friend, my lord deserves something. And it's not a little word, this, my lord. Take this. That's what my lord gives you. 
My lord, we will drink to the health of your grace. Your grace? Oh, 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 wait, don't go. To me, your grace. My faith, if he goes as far as highness, he will have all my purse. Wait, that's for my grace. My lord, we thank you very humbly for your liberality. He did well. I was going to give him everything. The four apprentice tailors celebrate with a dance, which comprises the second interlude. End of Act Two Act Three of The Bourgeois Gentleman by Moliere. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Three, Scene One. Monsieur Jourdain and his two lackeys. Follow me. I am going to show off my clothes a little about town. And above all, both of you take care to walk close at my heels, so people can see that you are with me. Yes, yes sir. sir. Call Nicole for me, so I can give her some orders. Oh, uh, don't bother. There she is. Scene 2. Nicole, Monsieur Jourdain, two lackeys. Nicole. Yes, sir. Listen. <laughs> what are you laughing about? <laughs> What does this hussy mean by this? <laughs> oh, how you are got up. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> what kind of little baggage is this? Are you mocking me? Certainly not, sir. I should be very sorry to do so. <laughs> I'll give you a smack on the nose if you go on laughing. Sir, I can't help it. <laughs> you are not going to stop? Sir, I beg your pardon, but you are so funny I couldn't stop laughing. <laughs> what insolence! You're so funny like that. <laughs> I'll... Please excuse me. <laughs> Listen, if you go on laughing the least bit, I swear I'll give you the biggest slap ever given. All right, sir, it's done. I won't laugh any more. Take good care not to. Presently, you must clean. <laughs> you must clean. <laughs> you must, I say, clean the room and... <laughs> Again? Nicole, falling down with laughter. <gasps> then beat me, sir, and let me laugh it out. It will do more good. <laughs> I'm furious. Have mercy, sir. I beg you to let me laugh. Have mercy. <laughs> if I catch you... Sir, I shall burst. Oh, if I don't laugh. <laughs> but did anyone ever see such a hussy as that, who laughs in my face instead of receiving my orders? What would you have me do, sir? that you consider getting my house ready for the company that's coming soon, you hussy. Ah. By my faith, I don't feel like laughing any more. All your guests make such a disorder here that the word company is enough to put me in bad humour. Why? Should I shut my door to everyone for your sake? You should at least shut it to some people. Scene 3. Madame Jourdain, Monsieur Jourdain, Nicole, Lackeys. Ah, ah, here's a new story. What's this? What's this, husband? This outfit you have on there? Don't you care what people think of you when you're got up like that? And do you want yourself laughed at everywhere? None but fools and dolts will laugh at me, wife. Truly, they haven't waited until now. Your antics have long given a laugh to everyone. Who's everybody, if you please? Everyone is everyone who is right and who is wiser than you. For my part, I am scandalized at the life you lead. 
I no longer recognize our house. One would say it's the beginning of carnival here every day, and the beginning early in the morning, so it won't be forgotten. One hears nothing but a racket of fiddles and singers, which disturbs the whole neighborhood. Madam speaks well. I'll never be able to get my housework done properly with that gang you have come here. They have feet that hunt for mud in every part of town to bring it here. On poor Francois, almost has her teeth on the floor, scrubbing the boards that your fine masters come to dirt every day. What, our servant Nicole? You have quite a tongue for a peasant. Nicole is right, and she has more sense than you. I'd like to know what you think you're going to do with a dancing master at your age. And with a hunky fencing master who comes stamping his feet, shaking the whole house and tearing up all the floorboards in the drawing room. Be quiet, both servant and wife. Is it that you're learning to dance for the time when you have no legs to dance on? Do you want to kill someone? Quiet, I tell you. You are ignorant woman, both of you and you don't know the advantages of all this. You should, instead, be thinking of marrying off your daughter, who is of an age to be provided for. I'll think of marrying off my daughter when a suitable match comes along. But I also want to learn about fine things. I heard it said, madame, that today he took a philosophy master to thicken soup. Very well. I have a wish to have wit, and to reason about things with decent people. Don't you intend one of these days to go to school and have yourself whipped at your age? Why not? Would to God I were whipped this minute in front of everyone if I only knew what they learn at school. Yes, my faith, that would get you in better shape. Without doubt. All this is very important to the management of your house. Assuredly. You both talk like beasts, and I'm ashamed of your ignorance. For example, do you know what you are speaking just now? Yes, I know that what I'm saying is well said, and that you ought to be considering living in another way. I'm not talking about that. I'm asking if you know what the words are that you are saying here. They are words that are very sensible, and your conduct is scarcely so. I'm not talking about that, I tell you. I'm asking you... What is it that I'm speaking to you this minute? What is it? Nonsense. No, no, that's not it. What is it we are both saying? What language is it that we are speaking right now? Well? What is it called? It's called whatever you want. It's prose, you ignorant creature. Prose? Yes, prose. Everything is prose that is not verse. And everything that's not verse is prose. There, this is what it is to study. And you, Nicole, do you know what you must do to say ooh? What? Say ooh in order to see. Oh, well, you. What do you do? I say you. Yes, but when you say ooh, what do you do? I do what you tell me to. Oh, how strange it is to have to deal with morons. You thrust your lips out and bring your lower jaw to your upper jaw. See? Do you see? I make a pout. Yes, that's beautiful. How admirable. But it's quite another thing. If you have seen oh and d d and f f, what is all this rigmarole? What does all this do for us? It enrages me when I see these ignorant women. Go, go! You ought to send all those people packing with their foolishness. And above all, that great gawk of a fencing master, who ruins all my work with dust. Well. This fencing master seems to get under your skin. I'll soon show you how impertinent you are. He has the foils brought and gives one to Nicole. There. Demonstration. The line of the body. When your opponent thrusts in quatre, you need only do this. 
and when they thrust in Tirse, you need only do this. That is the way never to be killed, and isn't it fine to be assured of what one does when fighting against someone? There, thrust at me a little to see. Well, then what? Nicole thrusts, giving him several hits. Easy! Wait! Oh, gently! Devil take the hussy! You told me to thrust. Yes, but you thrust in tierce before you thrust in quatre, and you didn't have the patience to let me parry. You are a fool, husband, with all your fantasies, and this has come to you since you took a notion to associate with the nobility. When I associate with the nobility, I show my good judgment, and that's better than associating with your shopkeepers. Oh, yes, truly. There's a great deal to gain by consorting with your nobles, and you did so well with your fine count you were so taken with. Peace. Think what you're saying. You know very well, wife, that you don't know who you're talking about when you talk about him. He's a more important person than you think. A great lord, respected at court, and who talks to the king just as I talk to you. Is it not a thing which does me great honor that a person of this quality is seen to come so often to my house, who calls me his dear friend and treats me as if I were his equal? He has more regard for me than one would ever imagine, and in front of every one he shows me so much affection that I am embarrassed myself. Yes, he has a kindness for you and shows his affection. But he borrows your money. So? Isn't it an honor for me to lend money to a man of that condition? And can I do less for a lord who calls me his dear friend? And this lord, what does he do for you? Things that would astonish you if you knew them. Like what? Blast! I cannot explain myself. It must suffice that if I have lent him money, he'll pay it back fully and before long. Yes, you're waiting for that. Assuredly. Didn't he tell me so? Yes, yes. He won't fail to do it. He swore it on the faith of a gentleman. <laughs> Nonsense. Well, you are very obstinate, wife. I tell you, he will keep his word. I'm sure of it. And I'm sure he will not. And that all his show of affection is only to flatter you. Be still. Here he is. Ah, that's all we needed. He's come again, perhaps, to borrow something from you. The very sight of him spoils my appetite. Be still, I tell you. Scene 4. Count Dorante, Monsieur Jourdain, Madame Jourdain, Nicole. My dear friend, Monsieur Jourdain, how do you do? Very well, sir, to render you my small services. And Madame Jourdain there, how is she? Madame Jourdain is as well as she can be. Well, Monsieur Jourdain, you are excellently well dressed. You see? You have a fine air in that suit. And we have no young men at court who are better made than you. Well, well. Madame Jourdain, aside. He scratches him where it itches. Turn around, it's positively elegant. Madame Jourdain, aside. Yes, as big a fool behind as in front. My faith, Monsieur Jourdain, I was strangely impatient to see you. You are the man in the world I esteem most, and I was speaking of you again this morning in the bedchamber of the king. You do me great honor, sir. To Madame Jourdain. In the king's bedchamber. Come, put on... Sir, I know the respect I owe you. Heavens, put on your hat, I pray you. No ceremony between us. Sir. Put it on, I tell you, Monsieur Jourdain. You are my friend. Sir, I am your humble servant. I won't be covered if you won't. Monsieur Jourdain, putting on his hat. I would rather be uncivil than troublesome. I am in your debt, as you know. Yes, we know it all too well. You have 
generously lent me money upon several occasions, and you have obliged me with the best grace in the world, assuredly. Sir, you jest with me. But I know how to repay what is lent me, and to acknowledge the favors rendered me. I have no doubt of it, sir. I want to settle this matter with you, and I came here to make up our accounts together. There, wife, you see your impertinence? I am a man who likes to repay debts as soon as I can. Monsieur Jourdain, aside to Madame Jourdain. I told you so. Let's see how much do I owe you. Monsieur Jourdain, aside to Madame Jourdain. There you are, with your ridiculous suspicions. Do you remember well all the money you have lent me? I believe so. I made a little note of it. Here it is. Once you were given two hundred louis d'or. That's true. Another time, six score. Yes. And another time, a hundred and forty. You're right. These three items make uh, four hundred and sixty louis d'or, which comes to five thousand sixty livres. The account is quite right, five thousand sixty livres. One thousand eight hundred thirty-two livres to your plume maker. Exactly. Two thousand seven hundred eighty livres to your tailor. It's true. Four thousand three hundred seventy-nine livres, twelve souls, eight deniers to your tradesman. Quite right. Twelve souls, eight deniers. The account is exact. And one thousand seven hundred forty-eight livres, seven souls, four deniers to your saddler. All that is true. What does that come to? Sum total, 15,800 livres. The sum total is exact. 15,800 livres. To which add 200 pistoles that you are going to give me, which will make exactly 18,000 francs, which I shall pay you at the first opportunity. Madame Jourdain, aside. Well, didn't I predict it? Peace. Will that inconvenience you to give me the amount I say? Oh, no. That man is making a milk cow out of you. Be quiet. If that inconveniences you, I will seek it somewhere else. No, sir. Madame Jourdain, aside. He won't be content until he's ruined you. Be quiet, I tell you. You have only to tell me if that embarrasses you. Not at all, sir. Madame Jourdain, aside. He's a real wheedler. Hush! Madame Jourdain, aside. He'll drain you to the last soul. Will you be quiet? I have a number of people who would gladly lend it to me, but since you are my best friend, I believed I might do you wrong if I asked someone else for it. It's too great an honor, sir, that you do me. I'll go get it for you. Madame Jourdain, aside. What? You are going to give it to him again? What can I do? Do you want me to refuse a man of this station who spoke about me this morning in the king's bedchamber? Madame Jourdain, aside. Go on. You are a true dupe. Scene 5. Dorante, Madame Jourdain, Nicole. You appear to be very melancholy. What is wrong, Madame Jourdain? I have a head bigger than my fist, even if it's not swollen. Mademoiselle, your daughter, where is she that I don't see her? Mademoiselle, my daughter is right where she is. How is she getting on? She gets on on her two legs. Wouldn't you like to come with her one of these days to see the ballet and the comedy they are putting on at court? Yes, truly. We have a great desire to laugh, a very great desire to laugh. I think, Madame Jourdain, that you must have had many admirers in your youth, beautiful and good-humoured as you were. By Our Lady! Sir, is Madame Jourdain decrepit, and does her head already shake with palsy? Ah, my faith, Madame Jourdain, I beg pardon. I did not remember that you were young. I am often distracted. Pray excuse my impertinence. Scene 6 Monsieur Jourdain, Madame Jourdain, Dorante, Nicole. 
here are two hundred louis d'or i assure you monsieur jordan that i am completely yours and that i am eager to render you a service at court i am much obliged to you if madame jordan desires to see the royal entertainment i will have the best places in the ballroom given to her oh madame jordan kisses your hands dorant aside to monsieur jordan our beautiful marchionesses i sent word to you in my note will come here soon for the ballet and refreshments i finally brought her to consent to the entertainment you wish to give her let us move a little farther away for a certain reason it has been eight days since i saw you and i have sent you no news regarding the diamond you put into my hands to present to her on your behalf but it's because i had the greatest difficulty in conquering her scruples and it's only today that she resolved to accept it how did she judge it marvellous and i am greatly deceived if the beauty of that diamond does not produce for you an admirable effect on her spirit would to heaven madame jourdain to nicole once is with him you cannot leave him i made her value as she should the richness of that present and the grandeur of your love these are sir favors which overwhelm me and i am in the very greatest confusion at seeing a person of your quality demean himself for me as you do are you joking among friends does one stop at these sorts of scruples and wouldn't you do the same for me if the occasion offered oh certainly and with all my heart madame jourdain to nicole ah, his presence weighs me down as for me i never mind anything when it is necessary to serve a friend and when you confided in me about the ardent passion you have formed for that delightful marchioness with whom i have contacts you saw that i volunteered immediately to assist your love it's true these are favors that confound me madame jourdain to nicole will he never go they enjoy being together you took the right tack to touch her heart women love above all the expenses we go to for them and your frequent serenades your continual bouquets oh, that superb fireworks for her over the water the diamond she has received from you and the entertainment you are preparing for her all this speaks much better in favor of your love than all the words you might have spoken yourself there are no expenditures i would not bake if by that means i might find the road to her heart a woman of quality has ravishing claims for me and it's an honor i would purchase at any price madame jourdain to nicole what can it talk about so much steal over and listen a little soon enough you will enjoy at your ease the pleasure of seeing her and your eyes will have a long time to satisfy themselves to be completely free i have arranged for my wife to go to dinner at her sister's where she'll spend all the after-dinner hours you have done prudently as your wife might have embarrassed us i have given the necessary orders to the cook for you and for the ballet it is of my own invention and provided the execution corresponds to the idea i'm sure it will be found monsieur jourdain sees that nicole is listening and gives her a slap say you're very impertinent to dorant let's go if you please scene seven madame jourdain nicole my faith madame a curiosity has cost me but i believe something's afoot since they were talking about some event where they do not want you to be today's not my first time nicole that i've had suspicions about my husband i'm the most mistaken woman in the world or there's some love affair in the making but let us see to my daughter you know the love cleon has for her he's a man who appeals to me and i want to help his suit and give him lucille if i can truly madame i'm the most delightful creature in the world to see that you feel this way since if the master appeals to you his valet appears to me no less and I could wish our marriage made under the shadow of theirs. Go speak to Cleont about it for me, and tell him to come to me soon, so we can present his request to my husband for my daughter in marriage. 
I hastened, madame, with joy, for I could not receive a more agreeable commission. Alone. I shall, I think, make them very happy. Scene 8. Cléante, Coviel, Nicole. Oh, I'm glad to have found you. I am ambassadress of joy, and I come... Get out, traitor, and don't come to amuse me with your treacherous words. Is this how you receive me? Get out, I tell you, and go tell your faithless mistress that she will never again in her life deceive the too trusting Cléant. What caprice is this? My dear Coviel, explain a little what you're trying to say. Your dear Coviel, little hussy, go quickly out of my sight, villainess, and leave me in peace. What? You come to me too. Out of my sight, I tell you, and never speak to me again. My word, what a fly has bitten these two. Let's go tell this pretty story to my mistress. Scene 9. Cléante, Coviel. What? Treat a lover in this way? And a lover who is the most faithful and passionate of lovers? It is a frightful thing that they have done to us both. I show a woman all the ardour and tenderness that can be imagined. I love nothing in the world but her, and I have nothing but her in my thoughts. She is all I care for, all my desire, all my joy. I talk of nothing but her. I think of nothing but her. I have no dreams but of her. I breathe only because of her. My heart lives wholly in her. And see how so much love is well repaid. I have been two days without seeing her, which are for me two frightful centuries. I meet her by chance. My heart, at that sight, is completely transported. My joy shines on my face. I fly with ecstasy towards her. And the faceless one averts her eyes and hurries by as if she had never seen me in her life. I say the same things as you. Coviel, can one see anything to equal this perfidy of the ungrateful Lucille? And that, monsieur, of the treacherous Nicole. After so many ardent homages, sighs, and vows that I have made to her charms, after so many assiduous compliments, cares, and services that I rendered her in the kitchen. So many tears I have shed at her knees. So many buckets of water I have drawn for her. So much passion I have shown her in loving her more than myself. So much heat I have endured in turning the spit for her. She flies from me in disdain. She turns her back on me. It is perfidy worthy of the greatest punishments. It is treachery that merits a thousand slaps. Don't think I beg you of ever speaking in her favour to me. I, sir, God forbid. Never come to excuse the action of this faithless woman. Have no fear. No, you see, all your speeches in her defence will serve no purpose. Who even thinks of that? I want to conserve my resentment against her and end all contact with her. I agree. This Count, who goes to our house, is perhaps pleasant in her view, and her mind, I will see, allows itself to be dazzled by social standing. But it is necessary for me, for my honour, to prevent the scandal of her inconstancy. I want to break off with her first, and not leave her all the glory of dumping me. That's very well said, and I agree, for my part, with all your feelings. Strengthen my resentment, and aid my resolve against all the remains of love that could speak in her behalf. Tell me, I order you, all the bad you can of her. Make for me a painting of her that will render her despicable, and show well, in order to disgust me. All the faults that you can see in her. Her, sir? There's a pretty fool. A well-made flirt for you to give so much love. I see only mediocrity in her. And you will find a hundred women who will be more worthy of you. First of all, she has small eyes. That's true. She has small eyes. But they are full of fire. The brightest, the keenest in the world, the most touching eyes that one can see. She has a big mouth. Yes, but 
upon it one sees grace that one never sees on other mouths, and the sight of that mouth, which is the most attractive, the most amorous in the world, inspires desire. As for her figure, she's not tall. No, but she is graceful and well made. She affects a nonchalance in her speech and in her actions. That's true, but she may be forgiven of that, for her manners are so engaging they have an irresistible charm. As to her wit? Ah, she has that, Coville, the finest, the most delicate. Her conversation? Her conversation is charming. She is always serious. Would you have grinning playfulness, constant open merriment? And do you see anything more impertinent than those women who laugh all the time? But finally, she is as capricious as any woman in the world. Yes, she is capricious, I concede. But everything becomes beautiful ladies well. One suffers everything for beauty. I see clearly how it goes. You want to go on loving her. Me? I'd like better to die, and I'm going to hate her as much as I loved her. How, if you find her so perfect? That's how my vengeance will be more striking. In that way I'll show better the strength of my heart by hating her, by quitting her, with all her beauty, all her charms, and as lovable as I find her. Ah, here she is. Scene 10. Cléante, Lucille, Coviel, Nicole. For my part, I was completely shocked at it. It can only be, Nicole, what I told you. But there he is. I don't even want to speak to her. I'll imitate you. What's the matter, Cleonte? What is wrong with you? What's the matter with you, Coviel? What grief possesses you? What bad humour holds you? Are you mute, Cleonte? Have you lost your voice, Coviel? This is not villainous. It's a Judas. I clearly see that our recent meeting has troubled you. Ah, ah, she sees what she's done. Our greeting this morning has annoyed you. She has guessed the problem. Isn't it true, Cleonte, that this is the cause of your resentment? Yes, perfidious one, it is, since I must speak. And I must tell that you shall not triumph in your faithlessness as you think. I want to be the first to break with you, and you won't have the advantage of driving me away. I will have difficulty in conquering the love I have for you. It will cause me pain. I will suffer for a while. But I'll come through it. And I would rather stab myself to the heart than have the weakness to return to you. Me too. What an uproar over nothing. I want to tell you, Cleonte, what made me avoid joining you this morning. No, I don't want to listen to anything. I want to tell you what has made us pass so quickly. I don't want to hear anything. Lucille, following Cléant. Know that this morning... No, I tell you. Nicole, following Coviel. Learn that... No, traitor. Listen. I won't listen. Let me speak. I'm deaf. Cleonte. No. Coviel. I won't listen. Stop. Gibberish. Listen to me. Rubbish. One moment. Never. A little patience. Not interested. Two words. No, you've had them. One word. No more talking. All right, since you don't want to listen to me, think what you like and do what you want. Since you act like it, make whatever you like of it. <sighs> Let us know the reason, then, for such a fine reception. It no longer pleases me to say... Let us know something of your story. I, myself, no longer want to tell you. Tell me. No, I don't want to say anything. Tell it. No, I'll tell nothing. For pity. No, I say. Have mercy. It's no use. I beg you. Leave me. I plead with you. Get out of here. Lucille. No. Nicole! Never. In the name of God! I don't want to. Talk to me. Definitely not. Clear my doubts. 
No, I'll do nothing. Relieve my mind. No, I don't care to. All right. Since you are so little concerned to take me out of my pain and to justify yourself for the shameful treatment you gave to my passion, you are seeing me, ingrate, for the last time. And I am going far from you to die of sorrow and love. And I... I will follow in his steps. Cleonte! Caviel! What? Yes? Where are you going? Where I told you. We are going to die. You are going to die, Cleonte? Yes, cruel one, since you wish it. Me? I wish you to die? Yes, you wish it. Who told you that? Is it not wishing it when you don't wish to clear up my suspicions? Is it my fault? And if you had wished to listen to me, would I not have told you that the incident you complain of was caused this morning by the presence of an old aunt who insists that the mere approach of a man dishonours a woman, an aunt who constantly delivers sermons to us on this text and tells us that all men are like devils we must flee? That's the key to the entire affair. Are you sure you're not deceiving me, Lucille? Aren't you making this up? There's nothing more true. It's the absolute truth. Are we going to give in to this? <sighs> Lucille, how with a word from your lips you are able to appease the things in my heart, and how easily one allows himself to be persuaded by the people one loves. How easily we are manipulated by these blasted minxes. Scene 11. Madame Jourdain, Cléante, Lucille, Coviel, Nicole. I am very glad to see you. Cleont and you are here at just the right time. My husband is coming. Seize the opportunity to ask for Lucille in a marriage. Ah, madame, how sweet that word is to me, and how it flatters my desires. Could I receive an order more charming, a favour more precious? Scene 12. Monsieur Jourdain, Madame Jourdain, Cleont, Lucille, Coviel, Nicole. Sir, I do not want to use any one to make a request of you that I have long considered. It affects me enough for me to take charge of it myself, and, without further ado, I will say to you that the honour of being your son-in-law is a glorious favour that I beg you to grant me. Before giving you a reply, sir, I beg to ask if you are a gentleman. Sir, most people don't hesitate much over this question. They use the word carelessly. They take the name without scruple, and the usage of today seems to validate the theft. As for me, I confess to you, I have a little more delicate feelings on this matter. I find all imposture undignified for an honest man, and that there is cowardice in disguising what heaven made us at birth, to present ourselves to the eyes of the world with a stolen title, to wish to give a false impression. I was born of parents who, without doubt, held honourable positions. I have six years of service in the army, and I find myself established well enough to maintain a tolerable rank in the world. But. Despite all that, I certainly have no wish to give myself a name to which others in my place might believe they could pretend, and I will tell you frankly that I am not a gentleman. Shake hands, sir. My daughter is not for you. What? You are not a gentleman. You will not have my daughter. What are you trying to say with the talk of gentlemen? Are we ourselves of the line of St. Louis? Quiet, wife. I see what you are up to. Aren't we both descended from good bourgeois families? There's that hateful word. And wasn't your father a merchant just like mine? Plague take the woman. She never fails to do this. If your father was a merchant, so much the worse for him. But as for mine, those who say that are misinformed. All that I have to say to you is that I want a gentleman or a son-in-law. It's necessary for a daughter to have a husband who is worthy of her, and it's better for her to have an honest rich man who is well made than an impoverished gentleman who is badly built. That's true. We have a son of a gentleman in our village who is the most ill-informed and the greatest fool I have ever seen. Hold your impertinent tongue. You always butt into the conversation. I have enough money for my daughter, I need only honour, 
and i want to make her a marchioness a marchioness yes a marchioness alas god save me from it it's a thing i have resolved as for me it's a thing i'll never consent to marriages above one station are always subject to great inconveniences i have absolutely no wish for a son-in-law who can reproach her parents to my daughter and i don't want her to have children who will be ashamed to call me their grandmother if she arrives to visit me in the equipage of a great lady and if she fails by mischance to greet someone of the neighborhood they wouldn't fail immediately to say a hundred stupidities do you see they will say this madame marchioness who gives herself such glorious airs is the daughter of monsieur jordan who is all too glad when she was little to play house with us she's not always been so haughty as she now is and her two grandfathers sold cloth near st innocent's gate they amassed wealth for their children they are paying dearly perhaps for it now in the other world and one can scarcely get a rich by being honest i certainly don't want all that gossip and i want in a word a man who will be obliged to me for my daughter and to whom i can say sit down here my son-in-law and have dinner with me surely those are the sentiments of a little spirit to want to remain always in a base condition don't talk back to me my daughter will be a marchioness in spite of every one and if you make me any angrier i'll make a duchess of her cleont don't lose courage yet follow me my daughter and tell your father resolutely that if you can't have him you don't want to marry any one scene thirteen cleont cobiel you've made a fine business with your pretty sentiments what do you want i have a scruple about that which precedent cannot conquer don't you make a fool of yourself by taking it seriously with a man like that don't you see that he is a fool and would it cost you anything to accommodate yourself to his fantasies you're right but i didn't believe it necessary to prove nobility in order to be monsieur jourdain's son-in-law <laughs> what are you laughing at there's a thought that just occurred to me of how to play our man a trick and help you obtain what you desire how the idea is really funny what is it a short time ago there was a certain masquerade which fits here better than anything and that i intend to make part of a prank i want to play on our fool it all seems a little phony but with him one can try anything there is hardly any reason to be subtle and he is the man to play his role marvellously and to swallow easily any fabrication we want to tell him i have the actors i have the costumes ready just leave it to me but tell me i am going to instruct you in everything let's go there he is returning scene fourteen monsieur jourdain lackey what the devil is this they have nothing other than the great lords to reproach me with and as for me i see nothing so fine as to associate with the great lords there is only honour and civility among them and i would have given two fingers of a hand to have been born a count or a marquis sir here's the count and he has a lady with him what my goodness I have some orders to give. Tell them I'll be back here soon. Scene 15. Dorimen, Dorant, Lackey. Monsieur says that he'll be here very soon. That's fine. I don't know, Dorant. I feel strange allowing you to bring me to this house where I know no one. Then why would you like, madame, for me to express my love with an entertainment? since you will allow neither your house nor mine for fear of scandal. But you don't mention that every day I'm gradually preparing myself to receive two great proofs of your passion. As good a defense as I have put up, you wear down my resistance, and you have a polite persistence which makes me come gently to whatever you like. The frequent visits began, declarations followed, after them came serenades and amusements in their train, and presents followed them. 
I withstood all that, but you don't give up at all, and step by step you are overcoming my resolve. As for me, I can no longer answer for anything. But I believe that, in the end, you will bring me to marriage, which I have so far avoided. My faith, madame, you should already have come to it. You are a widow, and you answer only to yourself. I am my own master, and I love you more than my life. Why shouldn't you be all my happiness from today onward? Goodness, Durant, for two people to live happily together, both of them need particular qualities. And two of the most reasonable persons in the world often have trouble making a union satisfactory to them both. You're fooling yourself, madame, to imagine so many difficulties. And the experience you had with one marriage doesn't determine anything for others. Finally, I always come back to this. The expenses that I see you go to for me disturb me for two reasons. One is that they get me more involved than I would like. And the other is that I am sure, meaning no offense, that you cannot do this without financially inconveniencing yourself. And I certainly don't want that. Oh, Madame, there are trifles. And it isn't by that... I know what I'm talking about. And among other gifts, the diamond you force me to take is worth... Oh, Madame, mercy, don't put any value on a thing that my love finds unworthy of you, and allow... Here's the master of the house. Scene 16. Monsieur Jourdain, Dorimène, Dorante, Laquay. Monsieur Jourdain, after having made two bows, finding himself too near Dorimène. A little farther, madame. What? One step, if you please. What is it? Step back a little for the third. Madame, Monsieur Jourdain is very knowledgeable. Madame, it is a very great honor to me to be fortunate enough to be so happy as to have the joy that you should have had the goodness to accord me the graciousness of doing me the honor of honoring me with the favor of your presence. And if I also had the merit to merit a merit such as yours, and if heaven, envious of my luck, should have accorded me the advantage of seeing me worthy of the... Monsieur Jourdain, that is enough. Madame doesn't like grand compliments, and she knows that you are a man of wit. Aside to Dorimène? As you can see, this good bourgeois is ridiculous enough in all his manners. <laughs> it isn't difficult to see it. Madame, he is the best of my friends. You do me too much honor. A completely gallant man. I have great esteem for him. I have done nothing yet, madame, to merit this favor. Dorant, aside to Monsieur Jourdain. Take care, nonetheless, to say absolutely nothing to her about the diamond that you gave her. Can't I even ask her how she likes it? What? Take care that you don't. That would be loutish of you, and to act as a gallant man, you must act as though it were not you who made her this present. Monsieur Jourdain, madame, says he is delighted to see you in his home. He honors me greatly. How obliged I am to you, sir, for speaking thus to her for me. I have had frightful trouble getting her to come here. I don't know how to thank you enough. He says, madame, that he finds you the most beautiful woman in the world. He does me a great favor. Madam, it is you who does the favors, and... Let's consider eating. Everything is ready, sir. Come, then, let us sit at the table, and bring on the musicians. Six cooks, who have prepared the feast, dance together and make the third interlude, after which they carry in a table covered with many dishes. End of Act Three Act Four of The Bourgeois Gentleman by Moliere. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Four, Scene One. Dorimen, Monsieur Jourdain, Dorant, two male musicians, a female musician, Lackey. Why, Dorant? That is really a magnificent repast. You jest, madame. 
I wish it were worthy of being offered to you. All sit at the table. Monsieur Jourdain is right, madame, to speak so, and he obliges me by making you so welcome. I agree with him that the repast is not worthy of you. Since it was I who ordered it, and since I do not have the accomplishments of our friends in this matter, you do not have here a very sophisticated meal, and you will find some incongruities in the combinations and some barbarities of taste. If Dami, our friend, had been involved, everything would have been according to the rules. Everything would have been elegant and appropriate, and he would not have failed to impress upon you the significance of all the dishes of the repast, and to make you see his expertise when it comes to good food. He would have told you about hearth-baked bread with its golden brown crust crunching tenderly between the teeth of a smooth, full-bodied wine, fortified with a piquancy not too strong, of a loin of mutton improved with parsley, of a cut of specially raised veal as long as this, white and delicate, and which is like an almond paste between the teeth, of partridges complemented by a surprisingly flavorful sauce, and, for his masterpiece, a soup accompanied by a fat young turkey surrounded by pigeons and crowned with white onions mixed with chicory. But, as for me, I declare my ignorance, and, as Monsieur Jourdain has said so well, I only wish that the repast were more worthy of being offered to you. I reply to this compliment only by eating. Ah, what beautiful hands! The hands are mediocre, Monsieur Jourdain, but you wish to speak of the diamond, which is very beautiful. Me, madame? God forbid that I should wish to speak of it. That would not be acting gallantly. And the diamond is a very small thing. You are very particular. You are too kind. Let's have some wine for Monsieur Jourdain and for these gentlemen and ladies who are going to favor us with a drinking song. It is marvelous to season good food by mixing it with music, and I see I am being admirably entertained. Madame, it isn't. Monsieur Jourdain, let us remain silent for these gentlemen and ladies. What they have for us to hear is of more value than anything we could say. The male singers and the woman singer take the glasses, sing two drinking songs, and are accompanied by all the instrumental ensemble. Drink, Drink a, a little, little Phyllis, to start, start the glass, glass round. round. Ah, a glass, a glass in, in your hands is, is charmingly, charmingly agreeable. agreeable. You, you and, and the wine arm each, each other, and I redouble my love for you, for you both. Let us three, wine, you, and, and me, Swear, my beauty, my beauty to, to an eternal, eternal passion. passion. Your lips are made yet more attractive by wetting with wine. Ah, the one and the other inspire me with desire, and both you and it intoxicate me. Let us three, wine, you, and me, swear my beauty to an eternal passion. Let us drink, dear friends, let us drink. Time that, that flies beckons us to it. Let us profit from life as much as, much as we can. Once we pass under the, under the, the black, black shadow, shadow, goodbye to wine our loves. Let, Let us drink while well we can. can. One cannot drink, drink forever. Let, Let fools speculate on the true happiness of life. Of our philosophy puts, puts it among the wine, the wine pots. Possessions, knowledge, and glory Hardly, hardly make us forget, forget troubling, troubling cares. cares. And, and it, it is, is only with, with good drink that one can, can be happy. Come on, then, wine for all. For all. Poor boys, pour, pour, keep, keep on pouring until they, until they say enough. enough. I don't believe it's possible to sing better, and that is positively beautiful. I see something here, madame, yet more beautiful. Aha! Uh -huh. Monsieur Jardin is more gallant than I thought. What? Madame, what did you take Monsieur Jardin for? I would like for her to take me at my word. Again. You don't know him. She may know me whenever it pleases her. Oh, I am overwhelmed. He is a man who is always ready with a repartee. But don't you see that Monsieur Jardin, Madame, eats all the pieces of the food you have touched? I am captivated by Monsieur Jourdain. If I could captivate your heart, I would be... 
Scene 2. Madame Jourdain, Monsieur Jourdain, Dorimène, Dorante, Musicians, Lackey. Aha! I find good company here, and I see that I was not expected. Was it for this pretty affair, Monsieur Husband, that you were so eager to send me to dinner at my sister's? I just saw stage decorations downstairs, and here I see a banquet fit for a wedding. That is how you spend your money, and this is how you entertain the ladies in my absence, and you give them music and entertainment while sending me on my way. What are you saying, Madame Jordan? And what fantasies are you getting into your head that your husband spends his money, and that it is he who is giving this entertainment to Madame? Please know that it is I, that he only lends me his house, and that you ought to think more about the things you say. Yes, what impertinence. It is the Count who presents all this to Madame, who is a person of quality. He does me the honor of using my house, and of wishing me to be with him. Oh, that's nonsense. I know what I know. Come, Madame Jordan, put on better glasses. I don't need glasses, sir. I see well enough. I've had suspicions for a long time, and I'm not a fool. This is very low of you, of a great lord, to lend a hand as you do to the follies of my husband. And you, madame, for a great lady, it is neither fine nor honest of you to cause dissension in a household and to allow my husband to be in love with you. What is she trying to say with all this? Goodness, Durant, you have outdone yourself by exposing me to the absurd fantasies of this ridiculous woman. Uh, madame, wait. Madame, where are you going? Madame, Monsieur Count, make excuses to her, and try to bring her back. Ah, you impertinent creature, this is a fine way to act. You come and insult me in front of everybody, and you drive from me people of quality. I laugh at their quality. I don't know who holds me back, evil creature, from breaking your head with the remains of the repast you came to disrupt. The table is removed. Madame Jourdain, leaving. I'm not concerned. These are my rights that I defend, and I have all wives on my side. You do well to avoid my rage. She arrived very inopportunely. I was in the mood to say pretty things, and I had never felt so witty. What's that? Scene 3. Coviel, disguised. Monsieur Jourdain, Lackey. Sir, I don't know if I have the honour to be known to you. No, sir. I saw you when you were no taller than that. Me? Yes. You were the most beautiful child in the world, and all the ladies took you in their arms to kiss you. To kiss me? Yes, I was a great friend of your late father. Of my late father? Yes, he was a very honourable gentleman. What did you say? I said that he was a very honourable gentleman. My father? Yes. You knew him very well? Assuredly. And you knew him as a gentleman? Without doubt. Then I don't know what is going on. What? There are some fools who want to tell me that he was a tradesman. Him? A tradesman? It's pure slander. He never was one. All that he did was to be very obliging, very ready to help. And since he was a connoisseur in cloth, he went all over to choose them, had them brought to his house, and gave them to his friends for money. I'm delighted to know you, so you can testify to the fact that my father was a gentleman. I'll attest to it before all the world. You'll oblige me. What business brings you here? Since knowing your late father, honourable gentleman, as I told you, I have travelled through all the world. Through all the world? Yes. I imagine it's a long way from here to there. Assuredly. 
i returned from all my long voyages only four days ago and because of the interest i take in all that concerns you i come to announce to you the best news in the world what you know that the son of the grand turk is here me no what he has a very magnificent retinue everybody goes to see it and he has been received in this country as an important lord by my faith i didn't know that the advantage to you in this is that he is in love with your daughter the son of the grand turk yes and he wants to be your son-in-law my son-in-law the son of the grand turk the son of the grand turk your son-in-law as i went to see him and as i perfectly understand his language he conversed with me and after some other discourse he said to me <clears throat> akiam croc soler uch ala mustaf gidelum amanahem varahini usere carbulat that is to say haven't you seen a beautiful young person who is the daughter of monsieur jourdain gentleman of paris the son of the grand turk said that of me yes inasmuch as i told him in reply that i knew you particularly well and that i had seen your daughter ah he said to me marababa sahem which is to say ah how i am enamoured of her marababa sahim means ah how i am enamoured of her yes by my faith you do well to tell me since as for me i would never have believed that marababa sahim could have meant to say oh how i am enamoured of her what an admirable language turkish is more admirable than one can believe do you know what kakarakamuchen means kakarakamuchen no it means it means my dear soul kakarakamuchen means my dear soul yes that's marvellous kakarakamuchen my dear soul who would have thought i'm dumbfounded finally to complete my assignment he comes to ask for your daughter in marriage and in order to have a father-in-law who should be worthy of him he wants to make you a mamamuchi which is a certain high rank in his country mamamuchi yes mamamuchi that is to say in our language a paladin paladin is one of those ancient well paladin there is none nobler than that in the world and you will be equal to the greatest lords of the earth the son of the grand turk honours me greatly please take me to him in order to express my thanks what he is going to come here he's coming here yes and he is bringing everything for the ceremony of bestowing your rank that seems very quick his love can suffer no delay all that embarrasses me here is that my daughter is a stubborn one who has gotten into her head a certain cliente and she swears she'll marry no one but him she'll change her mind when she sees the son of the grand turk and then there is a remarkable coincidence here it is that the son of the grand turk resembles this cliente very closely i just saw him someone showed him to me and the love she has for the one can easily pass to the other and i hear him coming there he is scene four cleante as a turk with three pages carrying his outer clothes monsieur jourdain coviel disguised that is to say monsieur jourdain may your heart be all the year like a flowering rose bush this is the way of speaking politely in those countries 
I am the most humble servant of his Turkish Highness. Karigar Kamboto Ustin Moraf. Ustin Yokutamaliki Bursum Basala Moran. He says, Heaven gives you the strength of lions and the wisdom of serpents. His Turkish Highness honors me too much, and I wish him all sorts of good fortune. Osabinamen Sadok Babali Orakaf Uram. Belmen. He says that you should go with him quickly to prepare yourself for the ceremony. Then you can see your daughter and conclude the marriage. So many things in two words. Yes. The Turkish language is like that. It says much in few words. Go quickly where he wants. Scene 5. Dorant, Cobiel. <laughs> My faith, that was hilarious. What a dupe. If he had learned his role by heart, he could not have played it better. <laughs> Excuse me, sir. Wouldn't you like to help us here in an affair that is taking place? <laughs> Ah, uh, uh, Coviel, who would have recognized you? How you are made up? You see? <laughs> what are you laughing at? At a thing, sir, that well deserves it. What? I'll give you many chances, sir, to guess the stratagem we are using on Monsieur Jourdain to get him to give his daughter to my master. I can't begin to guess the stratagem, but I guess it will not fail in its effect, since you are undertaking it. I see, sir, that you know me too well. Tell me what it is. Come over here a little to make room for what I see coming. You can see part of the story while I tell you the rest. The Turkish ceremony for ennobling Monsieur Jourdain is performed in dance and music and comprises the fourth interlude. The ceremony is a burlesque full of comic gibberish in pseudo-Turkish and nonsensical French, in which Monsieur Jourdain is made to appear ludicrous and during which he is outfitted with an extravagant costume, turban and sword. End of Act 4 Act 5 of The Bourgeois Gentleman by Molière this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act 5. Scene 1. Madame Jourdain, Monsieur Jourdain. Oh, my God! Mercy! What is all this? What a spectacle! Are you dressed for masquerade, and is this a time to go masked? Speak, then. What is this? Who has bounded you up like that? See the impertinent woman to speak in this way to a Mama Bucci. How's that? Yes, you must show me respect now, as I've just been made a Mama Bucci. What are you trying to say with your Mama Bucci? Mama Bucci, I tell you. I'm a Mama Bucci. What animal is that? Mama Bucci. That is to say, in our language, Paladin. Paladin? Are you of an age to dance in ballets? What an ignorant woman. I said paladin. It's a dignity which has just been bestowed upon me in a ceremony. What ceremony, then? Mahometa per Jordina. What does that mean? Jordina, that is to say, Jordan. Very well. What of Jordan? Voulez far un paladina der Jordina. What? Dar Tobanta con Galera. Which is to say what? Per defender Palestina. Oh, what are you trying to say? Dara, Dara, Bastonara. What jargon is this? Non tenere honta, questa star un ultima affronta. What in the world is all that? Monsieur Jourdain, dancing and singing. Hula ba, balachu, balaba, balada. Alas! Oh, Lord! My husband has gone mad! Monsieur Jourdain, leaving. Peace, insolent woman! Show respect to the Monsieur Mamamucci. Has he lost his mind? I must hurry to stop him from going out. Ah! Oh, ah! This is a last straw! I see nothing but shame on all sides. 
she leaves. Scene two, Dorant, Dorimène. Yes, madame, you are going to see the most amusing thing imaginable. I don't believe it would be possible to find in all the world another man as crazy as that one is. And then, too, madame, we must try to help Cleonte's plan by supporting his masquerade. He's a very gallant man and deserves our help. I think highly of him, and he deserves happiness. Besides that, we have here, madame, another ballet performance that we shouldn't miss, and I want to see if my idea will succeed. I saw magnificent preparations, and I can no longer permit this, Durant. Yes, I finally want to end your extravagances and to stop all these expenses that I see you go to for me. I have decided to marry you right away. This is the truth of it, that all these sorts of things end with marriage, as you know. Uh, Madame, is it possible that you should have taken such a sweet decision in my favor? It is only to impede you from ruining yourself. Without that, I see very well that before long you would not have a penny. How obliged I am to you, madame, for the care you have to conserve my money. It is entirely yours, as well as my heart, and you may use them in whatever fashion you please. I'll make use of them both. But here is your man. His costume is wonderful. Scene 3. Monsieur Jourdain, Dorant, Dorimène. Sir, we come to pay homage, madame and I, to your new dignity, and to rejoice with you at the marriage between your daughter and the son of the Grand Turk. Monsieur Jourdain, after bowing in the Turkish way. Sir, I wish you the strength of serpents and the wisdom of lions. I was very glad, sir, to be among the first to come to congratulate you upon rising to such a high degree of honor. Madame, I wish your rosebush to flower all year long. I am infinitely obliged to you for taking part in the honors bestowed upon me, and I am very happy to see you returned here, so I can make very humble excuses for the ridiculous behavior of my wife. That's nothing. I excuse her jumping to conclusions. Your heart must be precious to her, and it isn't strange that the possession of such a man as you should inspire some jealousy. The possession of my heart is a thing that has been entirely gained by you. You see, madame, that Monsieur Jourdain is not one of those men that good fortune blinds, and that he still knows, even in his glory, how to recognize his friends. It is the mark of a completely generous soul. Where then is his Turkish Highness? We want as your friends to pay him our respects. Here he comes, and I have sent for my daughter in order to give him her hand. Scene 4. Cléonte, Coviel, Monsieur Jourdain, etc. Sir, we've come to bow to your highness as friends of the gentleman who is your father-in-law, and to assure you with respect of our very humble services. Where's the interpreter to tell him who you are, and to make him understand what you say? You will see that he will reply, and that he speaks Turkish marvelously. Hey there, where the devil has he gone? To Cleont. Straf, strif, straf, straf. The gentleman is a grande signore, grande signore, grande signore. And madame is a dama grande dama grande. Ah, he, he, monsieur, he French mamamucci. And madame also French mamamucci. I can't say it more clearly. Good, here's the interpreter. Where are you going? We don't know how to say anything without you. Tell him that Monsieur and Madame are persons of high rank, who have come to pay their respects to him as my friends, and to assure him of their services. You'll see how he will reply. Alabala Krokiamaki Boram Alabaman. See? He says that the reign of prosperity should water the garden of your family in all seasons. I told you that he speaks Turkish. That's wonderful. Scene 5. Lucille, Monsieur Jourdain, Dorant, Dorimen, etc. Come, my daughter. Come here and give your hand to the gentleman who does you the honor of asking for you in marriage. What, father, look at you. Are you playing in comedy? No, no, this is not a comedy. It's a very serious matter. 
and as full of honor for you as possible. There is the husband I give you. To me, father? Yes, to you. Come, put your hand in his, and give thanks to heaven for your happiness. I have absolutely no wish to marry. I wish it, I who am your father. I'll do nothing of the sort. Ah, what a nuisance. Come, I tell you, give your hand. No, my father, I told you, there is no power on earth that can make me take any husband other than Cleonte, and I will go to extreme measure rather than... Recognizes Cleont. It is true that you are my father. I owe you complete obedience, and it is for you to dispose of me according to your wishes. Ah, I am delighted to see you return so promptly to your duty, and it pleases me to have an obedient daughter. Scene 6. Madame Jourdain, Monsieur Jourdain, Cléant, etc. What now? What's this? To say that you want to give your daughter in a marriage to a someone in a carnival costume? Will you be quiet, impertinent woman? You always throw your absurdities into everything, and there's no teaching you to be reasonable. It's you that there's no way of making wise, and you go from folly to folly. What is a plan, and what do you want to do with this assemblage of people? I want to marry our daughter to the son of the Grand Turk. To the son of the Grand Turk? Yes, greet him through the interpreter there. I don't need an interpreter, and I'll tell him straight out myself, to his face, that there's no way he'll have my daughter. I ask you again, will you be quiet? What? Madame Jordan, do you oppose such good fortune as that? You refuse his Turkish Highness as your son-in-law? My goodness, sir! Mind your own business. It's a great glory which is not to be rejected. Madame, I beg you also not to concern yourself with what does not affect you. It's the friendship we have for you that makes us involve ourselves in your interest. I can get along quite well without your friendship. Your daughter here agrees to the wishes of her father. My daughter consents to marry a Turk? Without doubt. She can forget Cleont? What wouldn't one do to be a great lady? I would strangle her with my own hands if she did something like that. That is just so much talk. I tell you, this marriage shall take place. And I say there is no way that it will happen. Oh, what a row! Mother! Go away! You're a hussy. What? You quarrel with her for obeying me? Yes, she's mine as much as yours. Madame! What do you want to tell me? A word. I want nothing to do with your word. Coviel, to Monsieur Jourdain. Sir, if she will hear a word in private, I promise you to make her consent to what you want. I will never consent to it. Only listen to me. No. Listen to him. No, I don't want to listen to him. He is going to tell you. I don't want him to tell me anything whatsoever. There is the great stubbornness of a woman. How can it hurt you to listen to him? Just listen to me. After that you can do as you please. All right. What? Coviel, aside to Madame Jourdain. For an hour, Madame, we've been signalling to you. Don't you see that all this is done only to accommodate ourselves to the fantasies of your husband? That we are fooling him under this disguise, and that it is Cleont himself who is the son of the Grand Turk? Ah! Uh, ah! Uh. And I, Coviel, am the interpreter. Ah! Uh, if this is the case, then, I surrender. Don't let on. Yes, it's done. I agree to the marriage. Ah! Now everyone's reasonable. You didn't want to hear it. I knew he would explain to you what it means to be the son of the Grand Turk. He explained it to me very well, and I am satisfied. Let us send for a notary. This is very well said. And finally, Madame Jordan, in order to relieve your mind completely, and that you may lose today all the jealousy that you may have conceived of your husband, we will have the same notary marry us, Madame and me. I agree to that also. Is this to make her believe our story? Dorante, aside to Monsieur Jourdain. 
It is necessary to amuse her with this pretense. Good, good. Someone go for the notary. While we wait for him to come and while he draws up the contracts, let us see our ballet and divert his Turkish highness with it. That is very well advised. Come, let's take our places. And Nicole? I give her to the interpreter, and my wife to whoever wants her. Sir, I thank you. Aside. If one can find a greater fool, I'll go to Rome to tell it. The comedy ends with a ballet. End of Act 5 End of The Bourgeois Gentleman by Molière